Yeah, I hadn't been to a WWE event in like 15 years, so I'm used to going to Staples Center and just getting a bunch of hot chicken silicone. But the WWE fan base, way different. It's like, imagine all of Riverside was at Staples Center. Nice people, though. Coming to you pre from the Best Coast Show studios, this is the Best Coast Show. I'm your host, Albert Aguilera. That's my producer, Curtis Stage. Curtis, our fan base totally cheaped out on us and did not help us raise the $4 billion in our Kickstarter. Yeah, that, I feel like that that was a little too much money for our fan base. It wasn't enough. But it was not enough. Reportedly, the UFC has been sold to WME for $4.2 billion, so we would have been a cool $200 million short. Yeah, now to keep that in perspective, though, Clash of Clans just sold for nine-something billion, so maybe it was a good deal. Maybe it was a good deal. Clash Clans involves fighting, too. There is fighting. There's, There's fighting, fighting on there, and, so, and people like the fighting. It's true. All right, so today is a UFC show, Albert. We are going to talk about Wonder Boy defeating McDonald. Uh, stacked UFC 200 card, which is coming up this weekend. This is very exciting. Fedor returns. Fedor. Fedor. Ret that's right. Fedor returns. That's not then, something we got to talk about because we got to let the new fans know who Fedor is. Yeah, Fedor returns. And, and then, of course, like you just said, the UFC's <laughs> been... Bought so allegedly. allegedly been bought, and then we also have a guest today. Yeah, guys, we do have a guest today joining us from bleacherreport.com, joining us via the magic of Skype live for us, but pre tape for you guys at home is our good friend Chad Dundas. Everyone, yay! Hey, hey, hey. Great hey Chad, you thank you for coming on the show, wasting your morning with us. How's the weather out in Missoula? It's starting to get hot, man. We just had the summer sol solstice yesterday, and uh. It's up around 85, 90 degrees, so nothing like what you guys are experiencing in the Los Angeles area. But uh, for us Northerners, pretty hot, getting there. I was at a Dodger game yesterday, and it was 101 degrees field level, and it was 112 degrees earlier that day when I was at the gym getting my ass kicked by my trainer, and I almost puked. See, that's just, <laughs> that's uncalled for. He's trying to get me in fighting shape. Well, and good luck to you. I haven't been in fighting shape for about... 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, UFC's indoors. Yes, luckily, so it is indoors. So uh, let's start off with the alleged reported sale of the UFC to the William Morris Group. That is head by Ari Emanuel. For those of you who don't know, Ari Emanuel is a powerhouse agent who is the figure that Ari Gold from Entourage is based off of. So it might be kind of interesting having someone like Ari Gold, who is Dana White to the nth degree, running the company now. Yeah, uh, my former colleague over at Bleacher Report, Jeremy Botter, who's now with Flow Sports, has been you know, out in front of this thing pretty much the whole time, reporting that early on the UFC had uh, accepted a bid from William Morris Endeavor and, and uh, several other large corporations, including the Kraft Group, which also owns the New England Patriots. Uh, as I think you said, the, the, the bid is rumored to be around $4.2 billion dollars. Uh, and then, you know, earlier today with another report from Jeremy Botter saying that Zufa LLC, who has been the parent company of the UFC for the past uh, 12 or 13 years, has accepted that bid. So, uh, you know, reports are out there that uh, the company is as good as sold. We don't expect an announcement of any kind until maybe the week of UFC 200, which is July 9th. Uh, the UFC, I think, uh, has come out pretty strongly and denied the claims that, that Zufa is selling the company. Uh, but Jeremy Botter has been very credible on these issues. Uh, in, in the past, we, you know, a, a lot of people have a lot of confidence in his reporting. So at this point, um, we have no real reason to believe that, that his reports are incorrect. And I think you're right. It's going to be interesting to see how this changes the dynamic of the UFC, just because we have every reason to believe that Dana White will stay on as the UFC president. But in the past, uh, the CEO of the UFC, Lorenzo Fertitta, has been kind of the voice of reason, if you will. Uh, Dana White obviously is a fight promoter and has a tendency to get very bombastic and can be very in your face. And at certain times during the company's history, it's, it's behooved them greatly to have a guy who is at least viewed as sort of a level-headed businessman like Lorenzo Fertitta who could swoop in uh, and, and calm things down at times. Uh, and how that will function moving forward is, is anybody's best guess if these reports turn out to be accurate. Now, this is going to do a ripple effect across all of the sport, not just the UFC, but the way it's going to go into China, the way it's going to handle stuff with Bellator, 1FC, because the UFC is the cream of the crop. They are the league that is the, I don't know, the it of MMA. So what is this going to do to the landscape of MMA, not just the UFC? Well, I mean, it's probably just too early to tell. Uh, you know, Jeremy Botter's reports certainly don't exist in a vacuum for the last couple of years. 
Uh, it's been widely thought throughout the industry that Zufa LLC has been courting buyers for the UFC either to sell a share of the company or to sell uh, the entire thing. And, you know, several years ago, you had a situation where while the UFC was was trying to break into markets in the Middle East and, and break into markets in India, uh, they sold around 10 percent of the company to an, an organization called Flash Entertainment, which is. Uh, you know, a, a division of the, of the government of Abu Dhabi, uh, <laughs> and now one of the rumored groups to be involved in in a, a the current sale uh, is a Japan or I mean I'm sorry a Chinese uh, venture capital firm uh, and some other organizations that have been you know active in trying to promote events in China, and it's been thought that the UFC has been trying to push into that Chinese market, and, and I think part of the sale might be for that reason. Uh, so, you know, to answer your question specifically, we don't yet know how the landscape of the sport could be changed. Um, conventional wisdom says that in the at least the short term, that any new buyers for the UFC would keep things relatively unchanged, at least in front of the cameras uh, for the foreseeable future, because we think that they're buying into uh, the, the UFC's current business model and maybe would not have great reason to change that in the immediate yeah, and one big thing that's been going around over the last couple of years is the Reebok deal, is fighter pay. If I just spend $4.2 billion to purchase something, I'm not going to go suddenly give everybody a raise. That's just me personally. So what do you think is going to happen to the fighter fighter pay, especially with someone like Roy McDonald, who just fought with Wonder Boy and is now officially a free agent? Yeah, you know, we, Ben Folks and I talked about that on our podcast uh, yesterday on the, on the co-main event podcast. And, you know, I think your logic very, very much holds true. If you're going to spend $4.2 billion to buy the UFC, you're certainly doing that based on the current projections of the business model and where you think that business is going. It doesn't seem very likely, at least to me, that someone would lay down that kind of money and then uh, come in with the idea that they were going to cut their own profits in order to, uh, you know, let UFC fighters in on a larger portion of the of the profits. But again, like if, if Jeremy Botter's reports turn out to be accurate, it's sort of a whole new world in terms of UFC ownership. Uh, we don't know if they will be more friendly to the forces of labor or less friendly to the forces of labor or just the same as Zufa LLC has been during its tenure as the owners of the, of the UFC. Uh, I think you've already heard a, a few fighters come out and, and voice their opinions that they they kind of think that nothing will change in terms of uh, the business model and what we see in terms of production and promotion, but they all hope that uh, that fighter pay goes up, which I suppose is is just the nature of the beast. Yeah, JoJo and Cerrone came out saying that they don't feel they're worth all that much of the UFC based on their paycheck, but then you guys, guys like Will Brooks, who's coming over from Bellator, who took a massive pay cut to come fight for the UFC because it, it is the, the elite league, and when you see guys training at the gym, they're not saying, hey, I want to be the Bellator middleweight champion. I want to be the UFC ex-champion. So do you, do you feel like a lot of fighters would be okay with n not getting the raise or with taking a pay cut the way uh, Brooks did just to come over to say they're a UFC fighter? Well, I mean, certainly part of the dream of being a high-level mixed martial arts fighter still involves fighting in the UFC and, and testing your skills against the best people in the world. Uh, so for sure, that's always going to have some panache. It's always going to carry with it a certain amount of respect uh, within the industry and, frankly, just in terms of, of name recognition throughout the sports world. I think that people have commented in the past before it, when they go around and tell people that they fight for, for Bellator MMA, people's first question is always, what's a Bellator? Uh, <laughs> so just in terms of being able to ex explain what you do to other people for a living, I think fighting in the UFC is probably uh, the, the easiest way to do it. Um, you know, the, the UFC certainly has built this amazing brand and is, is recognized universally as the leader in, in, mixed martial arts competition, but at the same time, the only reason that the UFC continues to enjoy that reputation is because it has the best fighters. And so I think it will be, it will be interesting to, to see how free agency starts to play out in mixed martial arts. Free agency is just starting to rear its head and become a, a more and more uh, you know, influential part of how the business works. And like you said, you've got Rory McDonald out there right now who just lost a fight last weekend to Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, but nonetheless remains uh, one of the top welterweight fighters in the world. And he's only 26 years old and, and is still, at least age-wise, viewed as being in the prime of his athletic career. So if a guy like that hits the, the free agent market and crosses over to Bellator and is able to find a, 
a deal there that he thinks works better for him just as a couple of other uh, UFC veterans like Phil Davis and Benson Henderson have done. Um, I don't think it would take as many high-level fighters crossing the aisle to Bellator as people think before uh, we would have a real competition on our hands. Yeah, I mean, a lot of guys, you only have so many years. Not everyone is Mark Hunt, not everyone is Randy Couture or Hendo who can fight into their 40s and are going to make that kind of money. So as a fighter, you have a small window and you want to try to make as much money as you possibly can. That's why Rory was very candid and said, hey, fuck it. I'm going to fight for whoever pays me more money. Now, you have guys that have names and you have a guy that just came back who's got a massive name in, in Fedor. And as Curtis called him, Fedor. Yeah. And the reason That's I... That's how you say it. Well, it's not Fedor. It's <laughs> Fedor. And my thing is, with, with the UFC, I feel that there's three versions to the UFC in the event that William Morris has purchased the, the company. I think it'll be UFC version 4.0. And what I mean by that is, I started watching mixed martial arts in 2000, 2001, where I was walking into mom and pop Korean shops at, and these video stores had these V VHS tapes in the way, way back, right next to the beaded porn curtains and the faces of death VHS was UFC 1, right? And you had, to, you had to get your friends who were 18 to rent these for you. And that's how I started. And that was pre-Zufa. So that was, in my opinion, like UFC version 1.0. And then Lorenzo came in, they bought it. That would be the second generation, UFC version 2.0. Eventually, 2011 comes around. Fox does their deal. They get in bed with the UFC. Now it's mainstream. That's UFC 3.0. And if William Morris buys it, it'll be 4.0, whatever. But the 3.0 and on fans don't know who Fedor is. They don't know pride. Is Fedor, in the event that he does come over finally after years and years of negotiation, are they? is the casual fan going to care or even know who he is? Would he sell on pay-per-view? Because he never fought pay-per-views. He did his yeah. pride stuff and he did the strike force stuff and the affliction stuff, but never pay-per-view. Yeah, um, I think that's one of the big questions about his career. Certainly it's uh, uh, the age-old combat sports story to have a guy like Fedor, who for so many years was regarded as the consensus greatest heavyweight in the world and you know for a long time the greatest pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world, right up there in the conversation with guys like Anderson Silva and probably John Jones mm -hmm. uh, as the greatest mixed martial arts fighter of all time. Uh, but he did the bulk of his work in Japan, like you said, early on uh, in the 2000s. Uh, and his his management team was ever was never able to to make a deal with the UFC to get him in the octagon in his prime. So it would be sort of like a classic combat sports turn of events now if he arrives in the quote unquote big time in the UFC. Uh, now that he's clearly getting up there in years and and very much past his prime, I don't know how he will be viewed by uh, modern fans who don't necessarily have the historical background to understand how important pride fighting championships was uh to the mma landscape uh during its heyday uh and, and maybe even people that that weren't really around for the affliction days or the the early part of the strike force deal uh but all the metrics and all the numbers that people have i think point to the idea that that Fedor Emelianenko is a person that at least commands some eyeballs from hardcore fight fans uh uh, to the extent that that would trans transfer to success in in terms of pay per view buys in the UFC, uh, I think is anybody's best guess. And and there's been some rumors that say that Fedor is quote, closer than ever to having to signing a UFC deal. Uh, and if the UFC is still pursuing him at this point, you got to believe that the powers that be think that he would still be some kind of a draw in the yeah. in the heavyweight division there. Yeah, because I don't think they're buying for his uh, talent level. They're buying Fedor, the brand. I mean, he's 39. He's about to be 40. But the heavyweight division is today and has always been extremely shallow. You always have the same set of guys fighting. And a lot of these guys are in their late 30s, early 40s. A lot of these guys are from the Pride era. A lot of these guys have already fought Fedor in Pride or in other promotions. So do you think, I mean, Maldonado whooped his ass the other day, okay? Plain and simple. He lost that first round 10-8. At best, it was a tie. But... Do you think that Fedor today would do well against any top 10 heavyweight in the UFC? Well, if we're, if we're going to go just off the version of Fedor that we saw in there against Fabio Maldonado, I think the, the obvious answer to that question would be no. Uh, he didn't look particularly <laughs> capable, aside from showing tremendous heart and, and you know having at least enough of a chin left to, to keep going after Fabio Maldonado dropped him in the first round. But... Uh, just judging by what we saw in that fight, and like you said, Fedor, 39 years old, about to turn 40 years old, it might not be a pretty picture to throw him in there with somebody like Brock Lesnar 
or, uh, you know, I'll, you almost want to say, heaven forbid, one of the uh, younger, more uh, talented and dangerous fighters in the division, like the current champion, Stipe Miocic, or somebody like Cain Velasquez. Uh, you just can't, at this point, foresee that going very well for the last emperor. And that would make a fairly sad end, I think, for a guy who has been reviewed and revered and, and regarded as close to a mythical creature uh, as Fedor has over the, over the course of his career. Yeah, that's pretty nuts. And the let's talk about EFN 50 for a second here. The promotional quality of this setup was amazing. <laughs> I mean, this this was a spectacle in itself. The show outside of the cage was just as great. And that's the, the kind of stuff I like to see. Yeah, and the announcer was fantastic. Do you hope to see some of this kind of stuff, like you know, spiders coming to, from the <laughs> ceiling and women just singing and dancing and and the orchestra? I mean, because the UFC did it for McGregor Mendez, where they had an orchestra and live music doing it. I mean, I would find out where Maricone is, and I'd say, bro, I'm coming into the octagon, ecstasy of gold, make it happen, let's go. What would you uh, what would you have be your walkout music if you're going out and you can pick someone to orchestrate for you? <laughs> wow, that is a tough question. Right on the uh, right off the cuff, maybe a, a full orchestra version of "Kickstart My Heart" by Motley Crue. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> nice. That'd be awesome. With I would actually just see it would be great if Motley Crue came out and did it. Not even a full orchestra version. Just Didn't then. they just retire? I think they could they just retired. They did a show in LA a few weeks ago, and Tommy Lee was getting. In his in his drum set, and he got stuck upside down, yeah. and he was fucking pissed. I'd be pissed too, but still, they would unretire. I think for a UFC for event. a UFC event, yeah, they would unretire. <laughs> but those rock but, and roll retirements are like those are like mixed martial arts retirements. Yeah, right? money grabs. They come back. Exactly. Let's talk about the stacked UFC 200 card. Stacked I mean, 200. It's so amazing. Brock versus Mark Hunt. You got Tate versus Nunez. You got Edgar versus Aldo. And I, I kind of feel that DC and Jones gets lost in in this card after the Brock Lesnar announcement, and you have. Edgar Aldo. Personally, I feel that the Edgar Aldo is really important because I don't want to see Conor McGregor fight at 145 anymore. I want to see him fight at 155, and I want to see Max Holloway at MSG versus the winner of this fight. What do you think of that? Yeah, uh, you know, people in the know have said for a long time that Conor McGregor would only go back to the featherweight division if he absolutely had to. Uh, he and his coach have always said that that's a super tough weight cut for him to get down to 145 pounds. And I think that he realizes that not only does he have an easier weight cut at getting to 155 pounds and even 170 pounds, but the bigger, more lucrative fights are there for him as well. Uh, and you, you see that in the fact that he's going to rematch with Nate Diaz at, at 170 pounds, even though that's not a weight that either of those guys normally compete at. Um, so I think, you know, depending on what happens in this rematch against Nate Diaz will probably dictate a lot of what McGregor does next. If he's going to hang on to that featherweight title and he loses to Nate Diaz, then I think you could see a situation where he might be forced to go back down to a, to 145 and defend the title against whoever wins the Jose Aldo Frankie Edgar interim title fight. Uh, but if he beats Nate Diaz at 170, uh, I think you get back into a situation where the, the world is Conor McGregor's oyster again, and he's able to sort of call his own shots. And if that's the case then I think you would probably see him stay at 155 pounds or at welterweight at 170 uh, and just take the, the, the biggest money fights that were available to him. And if that happens, then sure. Then you got the, probably the winner of Jose Aldo and Frankie Edgar against Max Holloway uh, for a, a, an actual version of the featherweight title. I don't think that they would let Conor McGregor hang on to an interim version of the title if he was going to continue to fight at those higher weight classes. Well, if he fights at 170, he wins at 170. I don't want to see him competing at 170. I mean, Robbie Lawler sent him a stern warning that if they did fight, he would take his soul. And <laughs> Robbie Lawler's a scary guy. I mean, yeah. I give it up to Wonder Boy. Wonder Boy wants to fight Robbie Lawler. That's insane. He's like a sociopath. I wouldn't want to fight Robbie Lawler. Robbie Lawler just looks like a scary dude. Like, just walking into a bar, I don't even want to talk to him. Yeah, that interview that they did with him where he said he would have taken Conor McGregor's soul looked like one of those HBO documentaries where they go to prison and talk to a serial killer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally. That was the vibe of that thing. And, and you know, in retrospect, just seeing how Conor McGregor gassed out and slowed down against Nate Diaz in their first fight and ended up losing, uh, you know, getting hurt badly by strikes on the feet and then eventually uh, getting submitted on the ground. In retrospect, that makes it seem like someone would have got charged with a crime if Conor McGregor and, and Robbie Lawler had gotten booked into a, a welterweight title fight 
which there were rumors that said that that was one of the things that, that they were looking at, one of the options that they were looking at. And certainly I don't think that would have gone well for, for Conor McGregor at all. No way. And then what might not go so well is going to be Brock Lesnar and Mark Hunt. Brock hasn't fought since 2012, 2013. You know, he loses that fight to Alistair Overeem. Alistair Overeem pops for steroids. He's coming back against a guy that is really, really good at punching people in the face. Is this a good idea for Brock? Well, uh, my podcast host, Ben Folks, quipped the other day that it did seem like Brock Lesnar had not paid any attention to the heavyweight division since about 2011. Uh, and when they asked him if he wanted to fight Mark Hunt, he was probably like, oh, Mark Hunt, he can't beat anybody. Uh, because at the time that Brock left, Mark Hunt was mired in like a five-fight losing streak. And certainly since Lesnar has been back in WWE, uh, <laughs> Mark Hunt has strung together a fairly Cinderella string of wins and, and eventually ended up fighting for the interim championship. Uh, so there's some concern that maybe Brock Lesnar doesn't know exactly what he's getting into here with this fight against Mark Hunt. Now, that said, though, uh, I wouldn't say I'm quite as pessimistic about Brock Lesnar's chances against Mark Hunt as a lot of people have been. Uh, it depends largely, I think, on how he looks when he returns. Like you said, we haven't seen him fight for four or five years, so we have no idea which version of him will show up to fight in the 2016 UFC. Uh, but if he looks as as dynamic and athletic as he did during his heyday, um, I think he has a better chance than some people are are, are giving him credit for here because... You know, granted, like you said, he hates to get punched in the face. That's one thing we learned about Brock Lesnar during his original tenure in the UFC. But I think if he is still possessing of his fast and athletic takedown ability, then yeah. you're going to have a situation where it might, you might still need a very special set of skills to beat Brock Lesnar. Uh, and it'll, it'll depend very much on whether or not Mark Hunt can stay on his feet long enough to land one of those knockout punches. Uh, so it's a, it's a matchup that I think is kind of interesting just from that regard in that we'll need to see Brock Lesnar uh, back at his, his 2010, 2011 UFC heavyweight championship form if he's going to beat a guy like, like Mark Hunt. But if he is able to marshal the forces and, and look as dangerous as he did during the prime of his career, then I think he's got a decent cha chance to, to win that fight. Now, yesterday, too, Roman Reigns was popped by the WWE Wellness Program, and a lot of people are giving the UFC shit about the USADA exemption and how Brock hasn't been tested or isn't being tested, whatever. But apparently he's been tested six times in the last three weeks or uh, two weeks since his announcement, and the Wellness Program caught somebody yesterday. So does that give it any kind of credibility moving forward, or do people are people just going to be like, hey, the UFC shouldn't be able to manipulate rules at their whim because it's convenient for him to fight at UFC 200? Both, I think. Uh, just because of the nature of the beast in professional wrestling, I think you're always going to have a lot of people look skeptically upon the WWE wellness policy. Uh, and we have no idea what kind of scrutiny Brock Lesnar was under while he was with the WWE in terms of drug testing. Uh, and one of the reasons why we don't really know is that he never really kept a full-time travel schedule with the WWE. He was worth so much money to them, and, and they considered him such a draw that they were willing to make kind of a sweetheart deal with him where he could appear at big uh, pay-per-view events and, and high-profile Monday Night Raw uh, broadcasts. And in between that, he was allowed to go back home to, to Minnesota uh, and you know live the quiet farm boy life that, that he seems to enjoy in between uh, stints as, as being the most dangerous man in the world. Uh, and so we just don't know like what the, what the drug testing was like for him in WWE. Uh, and the, you know, there, I, there are reports out there that he's been tested five or six times since signing his contract to return to the UFC. Uh, you can take that for what it's worth. <laughs> the, the, uh, the typical four month period that the U, the United States anti-doping agency asks for when somebody comes back for, from retirement is put in place for the specific purpose of, of having that four month period during which you can be sure that someone is not taking performance enhancing drugs. If you're going to test Brock Lesnar six times now, it really just uh, kind of reverts the testing back to its original levels. Uh, you know, before the UFC brought in USADA and intensified its drug testing efforts, you've had Brock Lesnar gone from the company for four or five years. Uh, we have no idea what he was putting in his body during that time. Uh, and to start testing him right now, um, it could be a little more than, than window dressing, really, because, you know, if a guy was going to use PEDs, this would be the time that he would taper off to, to get ready to approach the fight and, and your normal level of drug testing anyway.
All right, now let's talk about Tate and Nunez. I feel like, like if in the event that Nunez wins, she's going to throw a really big wrench into the UFC plans. Meanwhile, Tate's going around the country doing her media tour, and she's calling Ronda Rousey out at every opportunity she gets because she's at her highest, Ronda's at her lowest. I don't know if we'll ever see Ronda again. And the way I see Misha Tate, I kind of see Misha Tate as the Frankie Edgar of that division. She's not the best striker or the best wrestler or the best grappler, but this woman's got like the heart, heart of a lion. Yeah. You are not going to put this woman away. You, she could be down and out, and she's still going to be walking forward trying to strangle you. But wait, hold on a sec. But Nunez is, Nunez is kind of like that too. No, she's I, don't think kinda... she's a, I don't think she's a pushover, but I do think that the UFC put her up there knowing that Misha Tate could win. That okay. way they can rematch her with the biggest money fight. It, it doesn't. No one deserves anything in the UFC. It's about money. And also, Misha Tate is hotter. Misha Tate I, in is my hot. opinion. I, Misha Tate is hot. I'm not okay, going to lie. Hotter. All right. What do you think, Chad? About which question, you guys? Well, all of those, <laughs> but the, maybe the hotness She question. is an attractive <laughs> young lady. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't talk about that. We should talk Chad's about what married. they do. Ch don't Me get too. him in trouble. He's married. Me too. Yeah, my wife is totally going to watch this. So. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get that many viewers. Yeah, my wife does not watch this. <laughs> I think the point that you make, though, I think is is well made in that Misha Tate is going around on this on this media tour talking a lot about Ronda Rousey, talking a lot about Chris Cyborg. Uh, and I've seen the question raised elsewhere that she's not talking about Amanda Nunes very much. Uh, and, and people have asked the question if maybe she's overlooking Amanda in this fight. Mm. But I, I just think it's super hard to believe that someone who has been as a professional at a high level as Misha Tate for such a long time. And as you mentioned, someone that, that has such heart and such uh, a refusal to, to quit or be beaten and who always seems to kind of find a way to win. If you will excuse that terrible cliche, I think that it's a, uh, uh, it's kind of unthinkable to think that she would overlook anyone, especially since she's been waiting her entire career, ever since she lost the strike for, strike force title to Ronda Rousey, really, uh, to be the UFC champion. And now that she has that, I would be real surprised if, if she's not taking this assignment very seriously, even though the prize that she wants more than anything is to get back to a, a rematch against Ronda. Now, you see, in the event that she does win this, do you see a fight happening not MSG. Dana said that she's not going to be. Uh, uh, Ronda won't be ready this year. So, do you think that in the event that Misha wins in July, she's just going to sit around for seven months, eight months un until Ronda's ready, or do you think that she'll get a rematch with Home or or maybe Zingano, who who beat her prior to getting her title shot? Well, we're in uncharted territory here with Ronda Rousey. I don't know that we've ever seen anyone during the prime of their careers who has been as dominant as she was react to a loss quite this way. I don't think yeah. we've ever seen anyone take it this hard before. Uh, you know, we've never seen anyone take this kind of extended amount of time off that's not for an injury, but just seems to be uh, psychological. And so I think it depends largely on, on what Ronda decides to do. I would have thought she would have been back by now. I would have thought that she would be right in the thick of it, uh, especially knowing that Misha Tate is now the champion. Um, but I think that the UFC understands exactly what Ronda is worth to the company bottom line uh, and will probably let her call her own shots here. And if she is ready mm -hmm. to come back and fight Misha, then certainly they would go with that because that's probably financially the biggest fight you can make. Uh, if Misha gets past Amanda in this fight and Ronda is still not ready to return, I would be surprised also, though, if they let Misha Tate just kind of cool her heels. Uh, I think you, you would probably see her rematch with Holly Holm. Uh, and the great thing for the UFC is that that you have this three-headed monster, if you will, of female fighters in, in Ronda Rousey, Misha Tate, and Holly Holm, who can kind of all fight each other in a round-robin-style tournament in any order, and it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that they would just forge forward with that, depending on when Ronda's going to be ready to return. And I think at some point they would bring in Cyborg into this conversation because both Holm and, and Misha had said, hey, you know, you, you want to throw down, let's do it. Ronda's the only one that ever insisted that, that Cyborg come down because she was the champ, but she's no longer the champ. So I don't see why they can't fight at 145 because Ronda used to fight at 145, maybe do a catch weight at 140. But both Holm and, and Tate have said, hey, we'll go up to 140, 145, and we'll get this done. Now, honestly, I think Cyborg would beat any of yeah, these three ladies. Yeah. But, I mean, just, just the idea that Holm or Misha would move up to fight is, is, it says a lot about them. Yeah, I agree. And I think that the UFC is going to be more open moving forward to kind of mixing and matching those weight classes. You saw 
last week the first ever women's flyweight fight between Joanne Calderwood and, and Valerie Letourneau at 125 pounds, which is another div, uh, female division that the UFC just doesn't have. Uh, and it doesn't have a 145-pound weight class for Chris Cyborg to fight in either. But it seems like they're starting to understand that even if there aren't official weight classes at those weights, that you can still make promotable fights, like having Holly Holm or Misha Tate move up to 140 to fight Chris Cyborg. And clearly when she was champion, that was something that, that Ronda Rousey never wanted to do. Uh, but in the event that she returns, you know, then I think you've got, you, instead of having three a three-headed monster, you've got four women that can kind of fight each other in a, in a round-robin tournament, uh, which, regardless of whether or not there's a weight class at 140 or 145, I think is just good business for the UFC. Uh, those would be fun fights. Speaking of a fun fight, you're going to have the interim champion, John Jones, who I believe is the actual champion, and most of the internet does too, versus Daniel Cormier, the official champion, to headline UFC 200. Is there any reason to believe that this fight might be any different for Daniel Cormier? Well, you, if you watch the John Jones, Oven St. Pru fight, certainly the version of John Jones that showed up to, to take on OSP in that fight didn't look as dangerous as the John Jones who fought Daniel Cormier before his his suspension for the hit and run car accident, uh, but you also got to believe, just like I said about Misha Tate a few minutes ago, uh, John Jones certainly is taking this situation of the loss of his title and the propping up of Daniel Cormier as the new light heavyweight champion as a personal insult, and you know he's going to spin this in his own mind, his own competitive. Uh, athlete brain to to a situation where he really has something to prove. And I would be surprised if you don't see the very best version of John Jones in the cage with Daniel Cormier at, at UFC 200. And, you know, if you go back and, and watch their, their, their first fight, uh, it was competitive and certainly was an exciting fight to watch as it aired live. But, uh, you know, on repeat viewings, I'm not sure that it was, it was really terribly close. Uh, John Jones kind of had his way in that fight. Uh, clearly Daniel Cormier has progressed since then, but I think that, you know, if Jones shows up ready to go and in the best possible shape, uh, the smart money is probably still on him. Yeah. DC, when they had their sit down, said something to the effect that uh, I'd be willing to die in the ring. And John Jones is like, yeah, get ready for that. Like, I like the kind of animosity that happens between these two and the back and forth, but John Jones is clearly the well, you better I fight. mean, we, we talk about Clayton Kershaw on the show all the time and how people compare Clayton Kershaw to Clayton Kershaw, so it's yeah. not fair in the MMA community. John Jones fighting against OSP, people are like, oh, he didn't look all that great. But he didn't look all that great by his standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He still, like he said, had his way with him. He still dominated the, uh, the five-round fight. And so I don't think it's fair to John Jones to be like, he's not all that great compared to himself six months ago, a yeah, year ago. Because he's still the best fighter on the planet. Yeah, that's true. So I, I don't see why it would be any different for uh, Daniel Cormier in this in this matchup. I think if Daniel Cormier goes into it and actually attempts to fight him instead of trying to show that he can wrestle him, you don't do that. You don't <laughs> no. do that to John Jones. <laughs> no. I mean, Chael tried to show him that he could wrestle. He got he got throttled, okay? Yeah. And you go in there thinking you can strike with him? No, you're going to get throttled. I think John Jones does that to be an asshole. He goes, oh, you're really good at this one thing? No, no, let me show you that I'm better. Yeah. And then he does show you that he's better. That's why he's the best fighter on the planet. Hmm. It's going to be fun. I hope it's fun. But you know what was really fun, Chad? The other day I was uh, looking for a bookstore. And there's a bookstore that's right below my gym. But they're a big corporate uh, bookstore. So I was like, nah, fuck these guys. Yeah. And I went to a comic book shop. And I went to a comic book shop. And I pre-ordered a book. And I pre-ordered Chad's, Chad's book. Chad's book. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, yeah, so Chad's got a book coming out. It's coming out in July. It's called Champion of the World. You guys should pre-order it because, Chad, it's the first time you are going to be published, correct? Yeah. It's my, it's my debut novel. It comes out July 12th. Uh, pre-orders are super important to, to first-time authors because it dictates a lot of things with how your publishing company treats your book after it comes out, just in terms of how much uh, promotion they put behind it and, and how hard they try to place it in various publications and things like that. Uh, so I do ask people who feel like they're interested in the book to go and pre-order it and or buy it the week that it comes out at, at your local uh, independent bookstore or that big corporate bookstore. I'm not particular. Uh, because that, you know, is the best way for, for me to... Uh, uh, 
at least try to ensure that that my future writing career will go well. So yeah, I, I appreciate you going to the comic book shop to, to uh, pre-order it. I saw that on on social media, and uh, I was pleased. So thanks. I will not go to the comic book shop, Chad. I'm just going to do it the normal way and order it on you know on online. Amazon. Yeah, on a, is yeah. that okay, is guys? That I, I, look, <laughs> we're we're in Los Angeles, so we have not so many stores everywhere. All these stores are closing. I happen to go to a comic book shop every other Tuesday to pick up my comic books. So it's convenient. I was there anyways. But you guys can find it online on Amazon.com or various other online yeah. retailers, Books A Million, whoever. Pre-order the book so you can help Chad out called Champion of the World. Chad, tell us about your book. It's about, uh, it's about wrestling in the 1920s. It is, yeah. It's a historical novel about uh, professional wrestling back in the days when professional wrestling was more like the mixed martial arts that we know today. Back then when it, when it was a, a hard-nosed, legitimate sport and the guys involved in it had spent their entire lives uh trying to be the toughest guys around and the the book is about the time period in the early 1920s and late 19 teens uh when promoters started to realize that they could make more money by having fake fights than they could by having real fights Mm -hmm. uh and it's sort of about how that uh affects the main characters these these wrestlers that have worked so hard to be the toughest guys in the world and now find that the the only thing that they can do being uh, transformed into a glorified ballet dance, uh, and and the things that they try to do to to make peace with that. Now, the book takes place in Oregon in the 1920s. Are we gonna read the book and find out that the character in this novel is Chael Sonnen's great grandfather? You know, <laughs> uh, it's funny if if MMA fans read the book, I think that they will find uh, some Easter eggs in there. Nice uh, for, for people who like fighting circa 2016 because you know there's some there's some chael sonnen in there there's some matt hughes in there uh there's there's a little bit of dan severn these big uh uh athletic and sometimes chip on their shoulder style wrestlers that we have come to know and either love or loathe in mixed martial arts uh did in fact in in a great way inspire some of the characters who are in the book so i do recommend it for mma fans i think if they read it they'll find they'll find little bits and pieces here and there that they that they recognize awesome that's what we're gonna do we're actually gonna give away one of the books chad's been nice enough to autograph one of the books so when it comes out uh we're gonna put it up on the twitter account you guys can uh, figure out how to do that later we're gonna put up another contest we usually put up contests during hockey season baseball season but in this case chad's gonna sign one of the books for us and we're gonna send it to you guys we'll contact the winner we'll figure out a way to do it but uh look out on the twitter because that's uh that's exactly how uh that's exactly how we're going to give it away. But make sure to pre-order the book because it's really going to help Chad out being a first-time uh, uh, author, and it actually uh, helps him feed his family. Yeah. The one we give out will be the – you'll have two if you win. You could have the pre-order, the one that's going to well, come Well, I want a mail. copy for myself, especially now that I know there's Easter eggs in it. Yeah, and then the, and then the autograph book will Correct. come if you win. Uh, what's our gift of the day? Uh, Guys, our gift of the day uh, – I don't know if you guys watch the show Entourage, but this is uh, Ari Gold uh, freaking out, and this is what I imagine Ari Emanuel doing when uh, he found out that allegedly his $4.2 billion bid to purchase the UFC had come through. I like it. That's nice. a good idea. That's a good Ari yeah. Gold is going to be yelling at people at like pressers right next to Dana White. <laughs> like you don't awesome. understand. Dana White is like this this thing, and then multiply that to the power of ten. That it's is awesome. there is Ari Emanuel. It's going to be awesome. All right, guys. But that's been our show. Don't forget to stock chat on uh, the Twitter at Chad Dundas. Find his stuff on BleacherReport.com. Check out his uh, podcast that he does with Ben Folks, the co-main event. He also has a newsletter that he does every Friday called The Breakfast of Champions. It's fun. It's informative. And from what I understand, it's really easy to unsubscribe. Why you would do that, I don't know. I have no idea yeah. why you would. Yeah. But find them on the internet. You can find us on Twitter at Best Coast Show. We're on SoundCloud, iTunes, various other podcast outlets. But uh, look out for the book. We're going to give it to you guys. Pre-order it. That's been our show. And you guys have a good night.